the sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but it is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. He became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench, and he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. So today we are continuing on. 2023 is the year that we are all becoming acquainted with the Bible here at St. Bernard. So our Lenten Bible studies continue uh, to be bearing much fruit. And also on Sundays we are going through uh, some of the major stories of the Bible that all of us need to be familiar with. So last week uh, we talked about Cain and Abel. Okay, So uh, we're going to continue on today. So a little Bible trivia question. Genesis names Cain and Abel as the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Who is the third son? What was that name? Oh, all right, some children already know. I might have to give out extra prizes today. Yeah, what's the third son's name? Yep, you. Seth is correct. Awesome. Yeah. So Seth is the third son. Now, sometimes people wonder, right? So in the book of Genesis, where did all these other people come from? Right? If we only know about Cain and Abel and Seth, where did all the rest of the families come from? Where did the wives of Cain and Seth come from? Right? Well, it turns out that Genesis, there's kind of a, a throwaway line. It's in uh, chapter 5, and it says that and Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Okay? So they're not named in Genesis. However, Jewish tradition actually does give us the names of their spouses. Okay? So, uh, and yes, it's a little bit strange marrying your sister, uh, but when there's no other human beings around, right? that's what they had to do there in the beginning. Right? Now, another Bible trivia question for you. See if the children know this too. So in the Bible, there are two people explicitly listed as not having died in the Old Testament. Two people who didn't die. Everybody else. Any of the parishioners know? Right? Can we name the two people? 
right? So, yeah, you know? Moses and Elijah is very close, okay? So it's Elijah and Enoch, okay? Or Enoch. And Moses, she said Moses because even though it doesn't say so in the Bible, uh, again, that was part of Jewish tradition. People didn't think that Moses actually died, right? So, but we read about Enoch here in chapter 5 of Genesis, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And there's actually a lot of speculation about Enoch. There's a whole apocryphal book about Enoch that basically said he was assumed into heaven, and he was in heaven for a very long time, and then he came back down to earth, and then again at the end of his life he did not die. Right? The only reason I want to point this out to you is because uh, it gives us reason to believe, you know, one of the things that we believe as Catholics is that Mary never died, that Mary was assumed into heaven. And some people think that's strange. And I would just point out to them, you know, other people in the Bible right, didn't die. Okay. Now, what else is interesting here? So we, we read about Cain and Abel last week. And now this week, we're going to talk about uh, the flood of Noah. And I know that many of you are familiar with the story of Noah. So I just want to point out some specific details. Okay. So let's open our Bibles to chapter 6. And we'll read verses 11 and following. Okay. So if you have your Bible, chapter 6, verse 11 and following. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with all the earth. Therefore, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out. Okay? This is how the story of the flood is introduced. Now, some questions might arise. One of the main questions people always have about the story of Noah is, you know, did it actually happen? Right? In our modern culture, people are skeptical about most things in the Bible. We've talked about that before. Especially when it comes to the story of Noah, sometimes it's hard to tell because there's a lot of things that are a little bit questionable about the story. Uh, we're not sure if it was a completely a global flood or just a very large regional flood. Right? Either way, it would fit the text of Genesis. Also, it happened so long ago right, that the timeline is very confusing for scholars. And so it's very hard to prove either way right, how this story happened. But I would just point out to you all that some things that I think are very convincing. First of all, Jesus says that it happened right, in the gospel. He talks about Noah. Second of all, uh, people have studied the commands that God gave to Noah for how to construct the ark. And one of the things, uh, I believe they're called nautical engineers, basically engineers who work with ships and boats, right? Are there any nautical engineers in here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Basically, they, they've read this story and they, and they marvel at how accurate this depiction is of the ark because it just so happens that modern day engineers, right, they would build a ship that looks very similar to the ark. So if this was something that was made up a long time after, right, it's very hard to explain that. Or if it was just Moses writing his own opinion, right? Moses was not an nautical engineer, right? So how would he know exactly how this ark was supposed to be constructed? So I would just point that out to everybody. But there's some important details about this story that I think are significant for us, and I know that many of you in your small group Bible studies, right, you've talked about some of them, so I'm not going to repeat them today. I want to talk about some other things. First of all, the timeline of the flood. It says that it flooded for 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood actually lasted a lot longer, right? It lasted for almost a year, okay? And remember, the, remember how Noah knew that the flood was finally over? Remember the animals that he sent out of the ark? First he sent the raven out right, with the olive branch, and the raven came back, and then he sent out a dove, right? and the dove never returned. That's how Noah knew that the flood was over, right? That was the bearing the bearer of good news. Uh, fun fact for you, that's actually why that's how Christopher Columbus gets his name, right? Christopher Columbus. You guys realize that that's not actually Christopher Columbus's name, right? His name was originally Cristobal Colon. Right? They changed it to Columbus, right? which is the Latin word for dove. So the people believe that when he came to the New World with missionaries and priests, right? Obviously, they had political motivations, but they also had religious motivations. He wanted to evangelize the people. That's why the first thing he did when he landed was he actually planted a cross, on the shore. And so Christopher Columbus means the Christ-bearing dove. And that's how people uh, refer to him later on. And it comes from this story of 
Noah. Okay? Now, when the flood abated and God gave a covenant sign in the sky, the covenant sign was a rainbow, right, which all of us are familiar with. And if you're in your small group Bible studies, you know the reason why it was a rainbow is because it symbolizes God hanging up his bow in the clouds. Right? If you're an archer, if you're going to war, right, when the war is over, right, you hang up your bow in the clouds. Right? The violence is over. And God promised that he would never again punish humanity in that way. Now, something that's very interesting, I want you to read uh, chapter 8 now, verse 22. The very last line of chapter 8, when God is describing this covenant, it's very interesting. What Genesis 8, verse 22 says is this. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. I'll read that again. God promises Noah, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. What does that have to do with the flood and the rainbow? What Genesis is saying here is that we as human beings have God to thank for the regularity of our seasons. The fact that farmers can predict the seasons so that they can have their harvest. The fact that we can predict the sun and the moon coming up tomorrow. Right? And every such thing. What Genesis claims... Remember when the, when the flood started happening, it, it rained from the sky for 40 days? But Genesis says that it also, water came up from the depths of the earth as well. And you guys, some of you are nodding your head, right? You remember this, right? right? We talked about this in the Bible studies. So the beginning of Genesis, when God created the earth, right, it says that he made the waters subside so that the land could come forth. So in the flood, the opposite happened. is the chaotic waters from the deep came back up over the land. And the reason why that happened was not just simply that God wanted to punish humanity, but that was literally how the cosmos was created. That when humanity would become so sinful, the world would literally destroy itself. So God is saying here that from now on, He is going to prevent the world from destroying itself, no matter how sinful humanity can be. That's where we get the regularity of the times and the seasons. It's kind of interesting, right? I know some of you here are farmers, right? I wonder if you ever thought about that. That the world could have been created in a different way, where our sins would affect it. God has intervened and stopped it. Now, the other thing I want to point out today about the story of Noah, which I think is very significant, is what it must have been like for the people on the outside of the ark. Uh, does anybody, anybody know how long it took Noah to build the ark? You probably don't know it because it actually doesn't say so in Genesis. Okay. But the, the rabbis, right, in the Jewish traditions, they say that it took Noah 75 years to build the ark. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if this applies to you, okay? But very few of us in this church are even over the age of 75. Okay? 75 years it took him to build the ark, right? Longer than most of our lifetimes, and can you imagine what it would have been like for the people on the outside? Right? There's crazy Noah again, right? Still building that ark 75 years later, still waiting for the flood, right? Must have thought he was some crazy person. And then it says in Genesis that when the ark was finally completed, it still wasn't raining yet, and God told his family to go in the ark for seven days before it actually started to rain. Again, Crazy old Noah, right, going into his ark. What the early church fathers said about this passage when they read the story of Noah is they said that this is like a foreshadowing of people who are outside of the church. Noah's ark is symbolic of the church. And isn't that true? Aren't, aren't there people who are outside the church that look at us and just say, man, look at those crazy, outdated, superstitious people still believing all that stuff from the Bible. People think we're crazy. The early church fathers also said that the church is symbolized by the ark. That just as in the new covenant, 
We are saved through the wood of the cross and the waters of baptism, just as in the days of Noah, the people were saved through water and the wood of the ark. The church represents, or the ark represents a foreshadowing of the church. And unfortunately, all those people on the outside who think that we are crazy are in for a rude awakening. The church is the new ark. It is a refuge of safety and salvation in the midst of a very corrupt and fallen world. This is also what the church says theologically, right, about salvation through the church. You know, there's a, there's a phrase that you may have heard before. Uh, we don't say it very much in the church anymore because it's, uh, it often gets misinterpreted. But some of you who are older, you might remember this. And I'm, I want you to raise your hand if, you, if you've heard this before. Have you heard the phrase that outside the church there is no salvation? How many of you have heard that before? Okay. Okay, what does that mean? That means that just as in the days of Noah there was no salvation outside of the ark, so now anymore there's no salvation outside the church. But what does that mean specifically? Does that mean that people who are not Catholic or people who are in other churches are automatically condemned? No, that's not what it means. What it means is that there is literally no salvation in this world outside of the saving work of Christ on the cross. And what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. The church is the extension of that salvation throughout the world. Anybody who is saved is saved through the grace of Christ and therefore the grace of the church. But there are a lot of ways to be members of the church in different ways. Like people who are baptized in other churches, they literally are baptized. They are members of the church, even though they're not in full communion with the church. The catechism even says that people who have never even been baptized, the catechism says that we can still hold out hope for them. Because God is merciful, and many people through no fault of their own, right, who are sincerely seeking the truth, don't come to the faith. So don't think that we're saying that as Catholics, that we're diminishing everybody else, right? We're just stating a, ba a basic theological fact that anybody who is ever going to be saved, it is only through Christ. And there are many ways for that salvation to be extended. I think all these things are significant for us to think about, right? In the story of Noah, and I pray that all of us might have the courage of Noah to not be afraid of being ridiculed or being seen as superstitious crazy. Right? We might remain faithful members of the church throughout our entire lives, no matter how politically incorrect it might seem, no matter how much it might damage our reputations, right? that we will remain in the church to the day that we die. Right? 